Want to give another shout out to our sponsor this week, Manscaped. With a name like that, it can only be the number one brand in men's below the belt grooming. Manscaped is dedicated to helping you level up your full body grooming game. Uh, they just released their Shears 2.0 nail kit, which is the perfect add on to their Lawnmower 3.0 or perfect package. The perfect package 3.0 kit comes with the essential lawnmower 3.0 waterproof cordless body trimmer and a ton of other liquid formations to help you round out your manscaping routine i do love this trimmer it's the best trimmer on the market for those of you in need of a chest shave or a ball cleanup i don't i don't shave my chest i already told you that and I think I've said it too much already. Subscribe to the perfect package and get a new blade refill for your lawnmower trimmer delivered to your door every three months. That's pretty sweet. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code gas at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with code gas at manscaped.com. Do yourself a favor, guys, and always use the right tools for the job. The day that Felix Vankel had dreamt of since he was 17 years old had finally arrived. Now in his 60s, he was about to witness the zenith of his life's work. An engine that he devised when he was a teen was going in a production car. This engine was unlike any other in automotive history and would go on to attract a cult following all its own. It was not powered by conventional pistons and valve trains. Vankel's engine relied on spinning triangles. This is the underrated, underreported story of the invention and struggles of the Vankel rotary engine. Yeah, hello everyone. Welcome back to Pass Gas. Uh, I am one of your hosts. Uh, Nolan Sykes with me as always is uh, James Pumphrey. Howdy, more power, baby! <laughs> get the lasso and get them buff horses into the barn. Woohoo! More power, baby! Lightning and Joe Weber. Uh, fired up, wink, wink, nation. Hark, hark. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Uh, yeah. Hey, welcome back to the show, everybody. Uh, it is a Friday as we're recording this. Uh, I've had a in interesting week, I think. Well, maybe not that interesting because I've been in my apartment the whole time. But, you know, the the highs and lows of YouTube video production is kind of a, a wavelength this week, man. It was it was interesting for me anyway. Uh, I think everything is interesting when it's put next to the <laughs> what very are you, what are you talking about <laughs> i don't know i'm sorry guys <laughs> <laughs> i think everything is interesting <laughs> well i mean when you're in your apartment i this is week what 15 or 16 now of quarantine Yeah, it's like four months yeah it is oh my god um that's insane uh so yeah the 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 baseline has been set very low for the very for a very long time now so any mundane thing is now interesting yeah so as i said in the intro today we are talking about the rotary engine a very interesting design uh not very widely adopted across the the automotive industry uh for several reasons which we will uh go over this is a two-part series today we will be focusing on the the inventor of the uh wankel rotary design as it's known mr felix wankel uh, and then next episode, we'll talk about more, um, more, it, it's, it's spread across the industry and which manufacturers used it. We will be talking about Mazda next episode as well, but this one will mostly focus on Wankel, Felix Wankel and a company called NSU. Um, so yeah, are you, are, do you guys want to get into it? Are you guys ready? Everything is interesting. <laughs> Innovation <laughs> in any industry is hard. The Tucker 48 saw a complete failure when it tried to push too many innovative features in 1948. John DeLorean grew his career through innovation only for it to be torn down and fade into relative obscurity if it wasn't for the DeLorean's use in an iconic film. Bringing new technology brings an ungodly amount of risk. 
But sometimes that risk pays off, even if it doesn't always appear that way. For those of you that don't already know, the Wankel rotary engine is an internal combustion engine that uses a spinning triangle instead of pistons to make power. The radically different design of the engine creates a noise and performance like any other. But to really talk about the rotary engine, we first need to talk about the man who invented it, the subject of today's podcast, Felix Wankel. He's German. <laughs> nice pronunciation, dude. Thank you. W's are V's in German, or they're pronounced like yeah. that. But then Volkswagen, what is the V? It's called Volkswagen. Volkswagen. Look, I just like cars. I don't know how to pronounce anything, okay? In German, listener. V's are pronounced like L's, so it's Volkswagen. <laughs> I buy it. Yeah. Born on August 13th, 1902 in modern-day southwestern Germany in a town called uh, Lair, that's, or Lahr, L-A-H-R, Lahr, Felix Winkle was an extraordinarily bright kid. At a young age, he proved to have a great aptitude for mechanical imagination, but he didn't have the education to back up his passion. Um, just real quick note, as we'll see, he he chose to forego education. Vankel actually came from a fairly, uh, not well off, but you know, they did well. At the age of 17, he proudly informed his friends of a dream he had. Vankel had dreamt of an engine that runs with no pistons. It was, quote, a new type of engine, half turbine, half reciprocating. It is my invention. While his dreams were big, his education left a lot to be desired. The classes he had the least success in were mathematics and especially physics. A typical diary entry for him read, oh, James, you want to give this a good German accent here? Friday the 13th. Today I received yet another F in arithmetic. <laughs> Also, this man with a hockey mask and a chainsaw keeps chasing me around my summer camp. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, Felix left high school without finishing his degree, basically throwing any opportunity of pursuing higher education and creating his own engine out the window at the time. So instead of creating his own engine, he opened a machine shop in his backyard. Unfortunately, Wankel dove into business during a pretty crummy time in German history. Uh, the greatest conflict the world had ever seen had only ended two years earlier in 1918 and had directly led to the death of over 20 million civilians and soldiers and left Germany in ruins. I'm, of course, talking about World War I. Felix's father would be one of the war's casualties, representing a small fraction of the 15% of German men who had perished in World War I. On top 15%, by the way. Crazy number. 20 million people, 20 million civilians and soldiers. Like, I, uh, when I was looking up World War I stats yesterday, like, that just really kind of washed over me how huge that is. That's an enormous amount of people on one continent. There's a problem when numbers get so big that they kind of lose meaning. Mm -hmm. But then when you think about it, you keep thinking about it, it comes back around again and just kind of like hits you how many people that is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, 15% of German men had died at that time. On top of that, the Treaty of Versailles both blamed Germany for starting the war and ruled that the nation would have to pay back 132 billion gold marks in reparations, which is about $269 billion today. Nice. This had a devastating effect on the German economy after World War I. Quote, Germany had suspended the gold standard and financed the war by borrowing. Reparations further strained the economic system, and the Weimar Republic printed money as the mark's value tumbled. Hyperinflation soon rocked Germany. By November 1923, 42 billion marks were worth the equivalent of one American cent. What? Yeah, so... How do you buy stuff? You, you don't. The economy has just completely collapsed. That's where you see those pictures of, like, the German kids pushing wheelbarrows around full of money. Because it's worthless. Because they were print... They were just like, okay, we just got to print all this money so we can pay people back or pay the reparations but you know when you you know that's how inflation works like it loses value because there's more of it yeah but you Not get richer 
if you print more money, right? No. If you no, print Joe, your I just own told, money, I just told you. Then you become a millionaire. No, that's not how it works, Joe. I'm no, not that's I just watched a master class. <laughs> I just watched a <laughs> Tony I just watched Tony Hawk's master class and that's what he said. He goes, he all- once I learned how to kickflip, I was just basically printing money. Next thing I know, I'm rich <laughs> AF. <laughs> I think it was really not a great master class. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah, let's get into that for a sec because I saw I had a commercial for that master class yesterday. Uh, but like, how the how is a video gonna translate like to me getting better at skating? It's just not like it's tips and tricks. I tips know, to but do tricks, skating. Listen, like, I, I, I'm going through ticks. this with BMX as well. Like, you. Videos can only do so much to teach you. Like you really have well, to be yeah. out there every day practicing yeah. and figuring it out for yourself. If but you biking some... is differently. Bike, biking, biking. You're just like in one position, kind of, and you're like, you're sure your weight transfers and stuff. But with a skateboard, it's a different foot position for every trick. So that I know. could That's be what taught. That's what I'm saying. Oh, it could be well, I suppose that makes sense. I mean, BMX yeah, has. No a, there's a lot of positioning like that as well, Joe. You just get yourself an Apple Watch. You watch the Tony Hawk. You learn how to kickflip. <laughs> bing, bang, boom. Use the Birdman now. Then right. you're rich. Then right, you're rich. Yeah. So anyway, with the German economy in turmoil and institutions failing, there was a demand for someone to right the ship. The National Socialist Party, the NSDAP, better known as the Nazi Party, was founded by Anton Drexler in 1920 one year before Vanko left school without completing his degree. At that time, the best way into a formal career in engineering was through academia, but since Felix had dropped out, that wasn't very likely. So Felix looked for other ways to get his engineering prowess some attention, and like many other Germans at this time, he fell victim to the seductive pull of the country's latest authoritarian movement. In 1922, Vankel joined the Nazi party. The Nazis were on the fringe of German politics at their founding, but it wouldn't be long until they were in power and put their sadistic policies into practice. Throughout all of this, Felix never forgot about the pistonless engine he imagined when he was 17, and he was finally going to make it happen. He patented the design in 1929. In 1932, Felix ran out of money and moved back home to his mom in his hometown of Lahar. His mother was from <laughs> his mother was from an affluent family and helped bankroll a new shop space behind the house. Here, Felix would design his first automobile, the Devil Beetle. Developed with the help of his <laughs> colleagues, Wankel's car was a three-wheeled stream, stream, streamliner design. Not gonna lie. Why is if, colleagues in quotes? Does he have That's how they were like, described. Colleagues. Does he have little like like leather guys that come out of uh, like a devil hole and they come and do stuff for him. These are my colleagues. It was a raccoon and a bunny that lived in his mom's backyard. (laughs) My colleagues, mom. Because he was such a dork. Felix, your (laughs) colleagues are eating all my carrots. (laughs) Mom, they're not my friends. They're my colleagues. (laughs) Why would they be my friends? They're wearing little leather jackets, mom. <laughs> they all have friends. pocket protectors. We're at work, mom. <laughs> Your friends at work are called colleagues. God, mom. I'm a Nazi. <laughs> I wish I was never born in law. <laughs> Isn't it funny? It's just always like these loser <laughs> people who think they're better than everybody. <laughs> the first engine he and his colleagues put under the hood was a one cylinder lemon which barely made enough juice to get the thing moving so to their credit they designed their own two cylinder mill pushing seven horsepower enough to push the devil beetle to a respectable 50 miles per hour although i assume it took a while to get there i think you'd really like the way it looks james (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah it looks like a devil beetle imagine going 50 miles per hour in that thing hoob hoob call Ben Mota Basis. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like something a, a skunk and a rabbit would design. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need to get some better colleagues, man. <laughs> 
Sometime during World War II, Felix once again moved from his mother's house in Lahr to a new place in Lake Constance near the Austrian border in South Germany. It can be safely assumed that his mom also paid for his new digs at another shop where Wankel would begin seriously researching the rotary engine. A conventional piston engine has four distinct phases, or strokes. During the intake stroke, the fuel-air mixture enters the cylinder through intake valves. During the compression stroke, that mixture is squeezed together by an upward motion of the piston until the ignition or power stroke, where that mix explodes with the help of a spark plug and pushes the piston down, which helps your car move. The final stroke is the exhaust stroke, where what's left of the fuel-air mixture is pushed out of the cylinder by the upward-moving piston as the cycle begins again. Wenkel's rotary engine would operate with the same principles, but with a vastly different approach. Triangle-shaped components called rotors sit inside of an ovalish shaped housing. To better fit against the walls of the housing, the triangles have curved edges. They're called rouleau triangles. These rotors spin around an eccentric crankshaft. Each point of the rotor creates three sealed pockets of air against the inside edge of the housing. Because of the shape of the housing, those pockets get smaller or larger depending on where the rotor is. As the space expands, air and fuel get sucked in through an intake port. Then, as the rotor moves further along, it compresses the mixture. On the side of the housing opposite the intake and exhaust ports live the spark plugs, delivering spark and combustion. After ignition, that explody pocket of air gets pushed around to the exhaust port. For every three turns of the crankshaft, the rotor makes one complete circuit around the inside of the housing. There are only three moving parts inside of a rotary engine, which allows them to reach redline extremely quickly in comparison to conventional engines. What wasn't so quick, though, was Felix's ability to get the engine into production. I know that that was really confusing. Um, and if you want to know more and maybe have some visual aids, We've made a number of videos on our YouTube channel about um, rotaries. You should go check it out. It's, on, it's called Donut Media. Yep. Yeah, it would definitely help. Like, it's, it's like once you see a visual of how this is all working, uh, it makes a lot more sense. Um, yeah. So, while, so, so Felix had the design, he had that idea since he was 17, like two decades have passed. Still hasn't gotten it into production, though. Uh, but at this shop, he's like, looking at drawings and like trying to figure out how this is going to work. While Felix toiled in his lakeside shop throughout World War II, the quaint lifestyle came to an end when the Allies seized his machine shop after defeating the Nazis in 1945. They actually dismantled his machine shop as well, uh -huh. which is crazy. In 1951, Vankel started working with German manufacturer NSU who had bought the license to use his engine in their cars because he had patented it back in 1932, I believe. Felix began working with the NSU engineers to refine his design and finally put the Winkle rotary engine into production. Being able to rev super quickly was awesome, but it wasn't without its drawbacks. Early prototypes were prone to extreme friction wear, especially where the point on the triangle met the housing wall. It also didn't help that Felix had neglected to include any oil passages for the engine. The Vankel rotary engine first hit public roads in 1967 with the NSU RO80. But before we get to that, who the heck is NSU? NSU Motorenwerk AG was founded in 1873 as a knitting machine manufacturer before it eventually what? expanded. That's What's right. a knitting machine? You know, like a sewing machine. I got to see one of these boys in action. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it, James, everything is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's less... Wait, hold on, because right now it doesn't look like much of a machine, just like a helper. Well, it was oh, the 1870s. Nope. nope, it's a machine. Wow. <laughs> Dude, you get a knitting machine and some colleagues, and you're going to have a business in no time. <laughs> yeah, let's get those colleagues going. Isn't it weird that uh, all these companies started, like car companies started out making something like really kind of like, very surprising like peugeot made pepper grinders what are some yeah. other ones you got like you just did a wheelhouse on this uh yeah it's a lot of like uh 
airplane engines before, but um, I think I think just having access to like uh, machining equipment mm-hmm. around the turn of the century, you're like, yeah, I guess I could make a freaking engine block. Like, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> I have the means to do it. I'm gonna do it and cash in on this new trend, and then it's like this booming industry. Yeah, back then cars were like fidget spinners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like they were like, yeah, okay, like you all make it for six months. I mean, it's not it's not bringing in that pepper grinder money, but I guess I could make a Peugeot car. I think I'm gonna buy a Peugeot pepper grinder. They, they I have one they and it's well. great. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah, put some nutmeg. It, in it there. works too well. I I blew through a whole pepper grinder full of pepper <laughs> in like a week. <laughs> and I can't stop sneezing. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my colleagues can't stop sneezing. It is unfortunate that the fidget spinner became such a meme because I actually benefited from those very much. I loved having one at my desk. Uh, cause you I, can I'm still a fi- use it. No, it's got a stigma. It's got a stigma. Yeah, so they were known as a, a sewing machine manufacturer before. NSU was known as a sewing machine manufacturer. No, a knitting machine. Knitting, knitting machine. Knitting sewing machines. All right. Before they I eventually. Can confirm. Okay. I can confirm. I can confirm. I just watched the video. I'll take your word for it. I'll take your word for it. Before they eventually expanded into uh, the production of penny farthing style bicycles. You know, the big wheel in front, little wheel in the back. Makes it hard for ladies to ride it. Uh so yeah, they went from producing bikes to motorcycles, and by 1901, the very first NSU motorcycle rolled off the line. Very cool. They continued building motorcycles and cars for the next couple of years, including the first aluminum-bodied car, whoa, the 824 in 1923. Uh, not long after that, though, the company sold their automobile division to Fiat due to financial difficulties. The A24 sounds like when you don't properly name a file and you're just like, yeah, I guess here it is. And then someone's like, oh, I guess it's called the A24. A24, it's more like yeah. a date than anything. I'm going to guess that it was probably extremely expensive to produce an aluminum body car, which is why they had those financial difficulties. So they didn't have any money left over to name it. <laughs> That's what you're saying. Right? Happens, Used up man. our whole name budget on that aluminum. <laughs> What's up, guys? I just want to talk to you about our sponsor this week, Valvoline Oil. Uh, if you couldn't tell, I'm a big fan of Valvoline. They did send me this shirt, but I bought this hat. I went out of my way and I bought a Valvoline hat. That's how much I like this company. Valvoline was the first patented motor oil brand making it the original motor oil since their founding over 150 years ago in 1866 valvoline and their scientists have been innovating creating and reinventing oil formulas they were the first high mileage motor oil uh they were the first racing oil and they were also the first synthetic blend oil uh those are all a pretty big deal if i don't say so myself Valvoline is the only motor oil company with their own dedicated engine lab where they're able to run specialized engine tests and standardize engine tests right in their own facility. That's pretty cool. What this allows their scientists to do is uh, it gives them more freedom and flexibility to innovate as they have the results right at their fingertips, which just makes for better motor oil, quite frankly. All Valvoline oils exceed industry standards to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road, including mine. Uh, My cars run Valvoline, and yours should too. Get some Valvoline in your car. Thank you very much, Valvoline, for sponsoring this episode. If you recall the Volkswagen Beetle episodes, multiple companies were trying to create their own version of the people's car around this time. In an effort to get back into the automobile market at an affordable price, NSU commissioned engineer Ferdinand Porsche to build the first NSU Type 32. While only three Type 32s were ever made, as NSU decided there was more money in motorcycles than in people's cars, you can actually see one of the original Type 32s in the Volkswagen Museum today. And if you look up the NSU Type 32, it looks suspiciously like the Tatra 97, which we also talked about in the Mm -hmm. uh, Volkswagen episode. And 
Ferdinand also had another car, which eventually turned into into the Beetle. Everyone was loved ripping off the Tatra, which was of course the Czechoslovakian, or, or I, was it just yeah Czechoslovakian company uh, for the Beetle. I just wanted to add that little jab in there because you know Tatra deserves some love for that one. The Type Thirty Two looks like a Beetle if someone like scrunched its nose down. Oh yeah, yeah, it looks very, it looks- very, very similar. Throughout World War II, NSU was forced to change production from civilian motorcycles to the half-track motorcycle called the HK-101 used by the German army. After the war, the company struggled with their automotive endeavors, so they stuck to what they knew, making motorcycles. And as we discussed in our Hells Angels series, there was a huge motorcycle boom in both the US and Europe as people needed affordable transportation that could get over the now destroyed roads. It just turned into like a one big motocross track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone's like, I guess I'm a motocross guy now. Yeah. Jeremy yeah. McGrath was doing tabletops over yeah. intersections. This is when Mountain Dew was invented. <laughs> is that real? Yeah. Because now that everyone had motorcycles and everything was a dirt bike oh. track, water <laughs> just wasn't cutting it anymore. People were uh, like, I don't want an ale. I need a green beverage. <laughs> Do you know they did? They invented Mountain Dew to be a mixer for whiskey. Really? What? Yeah. Oh, I yep. got to try that. That sounds like some, <laughs> that sounds like riot juice right there. <laughs> <laughs> riot juice. I'm getting in a fight after drinking that. We can hire a consultant to get a a better name later, but I say we get this going now. Well, let's just go ahead and find a taurine distributor. Yeah. Yeah. Let's find some bulls. Uh, Let's, uh, uh, you know what? That's actually a myth. Uh, Taurine comes from bull fat, not bull semen. Gross. Either way, yuck. Yeah. Uh, So, So like monster isn't vegan? I don't think so. Really? Whoa, PSA for all my extreme vegans out there, all my vegan bros who like to get down. Monster is not vegan. A vegan energy drink is just getting a good night's rest. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, They always have their B12. Oh, yeah. Yeah, B12 is tough to get. I'm pretty much vegan. It's also omega-3 is tough to get. I I, I am not vegan. Not by choice, mm-hmm. but because of my sporadic grocery shopping schedule that I keep, which is like mm-hmm. every other week and occasional trips to my corner bodega, um, <laughs> I effectively haven't eaten red meat in like three months. So I yeah. had a, wow. I had a hamburger the other night, and it fucked me up for like two days. Whoa! Like I or not two days, but like I ate it, and then that night I woke up at like three in the morning. I felt like I was gonna throw up, so I like sat in my bathroom classic middle of the night bathroom sesh where you're just like in your boxers on your floor um, and you're kind of sweaty kind of sweaty <laughs> kind of delirious feeling like you're gonna throw up great mixture and then the re- the next day this was like wednesday i think i was i felt like garbage anyway there was that huge boom uh and going on in europe but people at nsu knew that the motorcycle boom wouldn't last And so they tried once more to enter the automotive market. It wasn't until 1957 that their interest into the four-wheeled market returned. And that year, NSU released the Prinz. P-R-I-N-Z, like Freddie Prinz Jr. The Prinz launched with the tagline, I'm going to mess this up. Uh, Can I try it? Yeah, go ahead. Fache Prinz und Du bist König. <laughs> Drive a prince and you're a king is the translation. While they intended to compete with the VW Beetle and making an affordable people's car, one look at it and you knew it wouldn't be winning any awards at any speed. With a two-cylinder air-cooled engine making only 26 buff horses, the 62 mile per hour top speed meant the Autobahn was kind of a drag. Autobahn... More like (laughs) auto-boring. But it filled a pretty niche market at the time that needed filling. (laughs) The only competition to the Prince was the BMW 700. Though it was obvious to both companies that any competition against the Beetle was futile. The Beetle. Beetle. 
Oddly enough, though, this little four-seater coupe found a lot of success in life and continued production through 1973. People loved that little two-cylinder engine, and although noisy, it had great fuel economy and was surprisingly reliable and easy to maintain. Astronaut John Glenn would agree with that statement. I will explain. There is the space race, which resulted in the Apollo program, which saw the U.S. put the first man on the moon. And at the time, NASA really loved Corvettes. But you would never hear them say that out loud, as NASA, provi- as NASA prohibited astronauts from endorsing any product or company. GM decided that since they couldn't give Corvettes to the astronauts, they would just offer them at very exclusive and lucrative lease deals. Astronauts were given the opportunity to lease up to two Chevys per year, per year, for a dollar each. 11 out of 12 of the original Mercury astronauts took GM up on the offer, and so did most of the Apollo astronauts. Uh, But while everyone enjoyed speeding around in their fancy sports cars, astronaut and future senator John Glenn decided to drive an NSU Prince instead. According to Glenn, he had a family to take care of, and that the money he saved on gas during his long commute, he could greatly uh, help pay for his kids' college tuition. So, that's guys, crazy that's crazy that he's he's like an astronaut, and he's like, and he's, oh, I gotta be economical with my <laughs> spending, or else my kids can't go to college. That's smart finances, guys. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, strap me to this big log of fuel and shoot me into space <laughs> <laughs> i think um later on we definitely have to talk about uh the the you know the astronaut we got to talk about the lunar rovers at some point uh because i would love to talk more about nasa and all that because yeah. space is cool <laughs> i went to nasa last like maybe last year maybe the year before that was not last year dude that was like three years ago now oh <laughs> But I rode in a uh, like a prototype Mars car. It was pretty cool. That's right. The we it would like the wheels would turn and it would crab walk. Yeah, that's so Whoa. sick. It was sick. Yeah. Yeah. Have yeah, you James. seen those those forklifts that have like cone wheels and they can oh, go yeah. in any direction? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Sick. They're so tight. My local Lowe's has one of those. Oh, nice. <sighs> yeah, that is nice. So the Prince was a cool little slow car, but what it morphed into was an even cooler slow car. In 1964, NSU released the NSU Spider, the first car ever to have a rotary engine designed by none other than Felix Wenkel. All my colleagues died. (laughs) (laughs) All my colleagues have passed. Of old age, the life expectancy for a skunk and a turtle. <laughs> Our turtles are pretty like <laughs> My only colleague left is the turtle. <laughs> the rabbit and the, the skunk and the raccoon are all dead. The turtle will outlive me and carry on the the legacy of the Vankel rotary engine. <laughs> he will live to be 182 years old. <laughs> we will send the rotary to Mars. I will bestow all the rights for my engine to the turtle and you live <laughs> well beyond my years. The NSU Spider was basically the beta test for rotary engines, and few consumers were interested in dealing with the company trying to iron out the kinks. The biggest issue that plagued the rotary engine was the apex seals, graphite shims that maintained a sealer between the pointed triangular rotors to the chamber walls. NSU hoped they could get the seals to last at least 50,000 miles, but that was a pipe dream. Fortunately for consumers... burn it, burn it. Fortunately for (laughs) consumers... Fortunately for consumers, and unfortunately for the company, NSU replaced seals that failed prematurely under warranty. Since the car retailed at only $3,000, it quickly started costing more to uphold the warranty than the car was worth. To prevent apex seal failure, the red line was sent at six. The red line was set at six thousand RPM. Though apparently the car wouldn't start running comfortably until eight or nine thousand. The Spider could do zero to sixty in seventeen point four seconds, but that time could be cut to fourteen point five seconds if you shifted at eight thousand RPM instead of six thousand, at the expense of your apex seals. It's like using launch control in your uh, in your R thirty five GTR. You know, you can only do it so many times. 
uh, before your car needs a lot of servicing and it voids your warranty if you use it at all, right? Is that still the case? That was the case when the car first really? came out. Yeah. Yeah. Because it puts so much stress on the uh, drivetrain of the car that they're like, well, you did this at your own volition. The Spider didn't exactly sell very well. The 50 horsepower rotary engine was an unproven novelty. And while it could be modified to make a little over 100 horsepowers, it still didn't have a wide enough appeal to be successful. 2,375 Spiders were sold worldwide with only 215 of them reaching the U.S. market. But the company didn't... Who's buying spiders? I have them in my bathroom for free. (laughs) 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 They bite my eyes. (laughs) But the company didn't actually really plan for the spider to be a huge commercial success. They had hoped to gauge interest in rotary design as well as work out any flaws before really going all in on the design. Despite all the flaws of the spider, NSU believed it could be fixed. In 1967... After spending all of their free time shadow boxing in a mirror and hyping themselves up by saying things like, BMW and Mercedes are nothing. You're NSU. Instead of refining their rotary design, NSU brought the world the NSU R080, a car that is widely regarded as the most modern 50 year old car you can buy. It looks R- really good. It looks like it came out in like the early 80s. Um, really? Yeah. It's pretty cool. I mean, it's just like, it's not like the greatest looking car, but like the fact that it came out in the late sixties and looks as modern as it does. Yeah. uh, is pretty impressive. It's pretty modern looking. I'll give you that much. I'll give you that much. The RO80 was powered by a 113 horsepower twin rotor engine and a pretty cool semi-automatic transmission. The vacuum operated clutch, a major innovation at the time, was actually activated by pressing the gear shifter knob. The body was sleek and aerodynamic, making it one of the most aerodynamic cars on the road at the time and oddly futuristic looking. Like we Holds said, up. it's aged very well. Very modern looking little guy. That's kind of like um, the new transmission that Hyundai just released, right? That mm. it's like clutchless? Yeah. Well, I haven't looked into that, but I saw the headline. Yeah, like most Americans, I didn't read the article either. I just got, I saw the headline and got angry. Yeah, and then I shared it. Then I shared it. Then I shared it on my Instagram. (laughs) The RO80 was also front wheel drive, which was a big deal in 1967. People loved this car for its super sleek design and smooth ride. A popular trend among reviewers was to praise even a single one of the advanced components from this car would make for a great experience, but having them all put together, it's simply amazing. It's like <laughs> ice cream is good. Sprinkles are good. Hot fudge is good. Whipped cream is good. The, the cherries is good, but you put them all together in a Sunday. Ooh, blissful. You get the brownie under there. Get out of town, Jack. That's a birthday party. Simply mouse watering. Simply mouse watering. Oh, I need to go to the Baskin Robbins or Thirty Four One for <laughs> flavors, depending on what region you live in. <laughs> it was a weird, a very weird article. <laughs> the, the oh, that was at, that was verbatim. <laughs> yeah, that was verbatim. That was from the article. It was in quotes. Okay. From the, 1967 uh, <laughs> Motor Trend magazine. <laughs> Weird. The front mounted inboard disc brakes reduced unsprung weight, making for an extra comfortable ride when combined with the complete McPherson strut suspension. Speaking of comfort, the one liter twin rotor engine ran unbelievably smoothly. While we all know and love the sound of the Mazda RX 7 rotary, this engine sounded completely different as it quietly moved through its rev range. It'd be so tight to take one of these cars and then put a built two rotor, four rotor Aaron's, like our buddy Aaron Parker's RX-7 in here and just die instantly. God, I love the way these things sound. It was a pretty cool car. Summer's in full action and we're thankful for our sponsor today, Manscaped, for keeping us fresh nice and clean and cut and ready to tackle summer and anything it throws at us 
Manscaped is dedicated to helping you level up your body grooming game. They actually just released their Shears 2.0, which kind of coincides with the Lawnmower 3.0. And the Shears 2.0 is a luxury four piece nail kit featuring tempered stainless steel tools. I mean, it's summer, you're gonna be wearing flip flops. You don't want people to see your nasty toenails hanging out. The Perfect Package 3.0 comes with the Essential Lawnmower 3.0, cordless body trimmer, and a ton of other liquid formulations to round out your manscaping routine. Honestly, this is the best trimmer on the market. I can speak from experience that it's super easy to use. Inside the Perfect Package, you'll also find the Manscaped Crop Preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant, and moisturizer because we all know how painful chafing can get. I can speak to that as well. It's summer, getting a little muggy it's like Dagobah it's like a swamp planet down there but then when you trim it it's like when Luke Skywalker brings the x-wing out of the swamp that's that's my dong get 20% off and free shipping with the code gas at manscaped.com that's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code gas g-a-s summer's freaking here dog it's time to manscape the RO80 was a pretty cool car, and the world loved it. The world loved it so much, in fact, that it was given the title as European Car of the Year in 1968. Pretty neat. Unfortunately, receiving the Car of the Year award wasn't enough to save NSU. The RO80 still shared many of the issues that limited the success of the NSU Spider a few years earlier. The most notable of those issues were those dang unreliable apex seals while the premature failure of apex seals was somewhat fixed in the later model ro80 the early versions of the car could still barely push 30,000 miles on the engine with regular maintenance before an apex seal needed replaced an engine lasting only 15,000 miles before repair wasn't unheard of a majority of the repairs so yeah you had the car for maybe like a year and a half and it already needs a major uh, repair. I've uh, only had my car for a month and it needs major repairs. <laughs> that thing's like 40 years old now, though. <laughs> yeah. Freaking Your God. car's 70. That is true. That is true. <laughs> uh, I will be coming over this weekend. I got the bracket finally for the generator. Uh, That's so exciting. That is exciting. My dad found it on eBay and I finally have jacks and a jack stand so he can lift that pupper up and nice. take the wheels off and look at the brake system and all that i ordered a whole grip of parts hopefully something shows up today so i can work on my car too there you go man yeah i ordered a bunch of parts for my car and it was like pretty expensive but none of them are fun oh <laughs> oh no that's like the least that's not yeah. fun you already have fun parts on there that's kind of the problem with your car is that it's already a project car so it has the coolest stuff mm -hmm. like yeah. coilovers and wheels and all that now yeah. you have like super unsexy maintenance stuff that you got to do. Yeah, I ordered four hundred dollars <laughs> worth of gaskets. <laughs> oh, wow! And then uh, I ordered a, a whole uh, hardware kit, so I have like all the. I'm oh, trying wow. to de trying to develop a little bit of OCD. Like none none of my personality is like OCD at all. I'm very like Meh, whatever. So I'm trying to like <laughs> in my. In my old age, I'm trying to become particular. I think that car definitely cool. deserves to have that treatment because it's so funny watching that episode. If you guys haven't seen the episode of Money Pit, James took his car to the Money Pit house. Job went over it with a fine-tuned comb, found a lot of issues. It's so funny, though, because there's still comments where like pe people are like, James, dude, that thing is perfect. It's like, no, it's not. Clearly, it's not. <laughs> like, we have to take the transmission out. <laughs> yeah, like, let's let's encourage James to actually to, to make this thing truly nice because mm -hmm. uh, I think it really deserves it because that thing is really fun. It just yeah. rattles a shit ton when you're driving it. It rattles less now. We, we put some bolts in it. Tightened oh, nice. It, nice. Good. I'm wonder I'm wondering how much my car I don't think my car's gonna rattle uh mm -hmm. as much as it's gonna like squeak. Squeak. Your car's your car's gonna sound like uh, a submarine that dove too deep. It's like <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. And then for some reason one of my colleagues is gonna crush an <laughs> egg in his hand to demonstrate pressure for the audience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that thing might have some college anyway. living in it. 
<laughs> <laughs> it might. A lot of spiders, maybe. A majority of the repairs fell into NSU's lap under warranty, and replacing hundreds of engines quickly started eating away at any capital the company had left. The premature failures meant that owners would have to keep their cars in the shop more often than owners of conventional internal combustion engines. Combined with the fact that gas mileage honestly wasn't that great by European standards at the time, only getting about 13 to 20 miles per gallon, the RO80 wasn't exactly flying off the lot. Uh, by the way, 13 to 20 miles per gallon, that's about as much as my Mustang gets on a good week. So not much has changed. The car was so unreliable, in fact, that companies such as the Hurley Engineering Company in the UK supplied conversion kits that allowed people to swap their twin rotor Vankel engine with a Ford Essex four-cylinder piston engine instead. The conversion was definitely nowhere near as comfortable as the rotary, but it does show how much the reliability of the rotary did impact the success of the RO80. Aside from the engine, the RO80 was still one of the most advanced luxury sedans on the road. By 1970, the apex seal issue was mostly resolved, but that didn't repair the reputation of NSU it had destroyed. NSU was a motorcycle company at heart. After their first attempt to enter the car market failed in 1930, they believed they could find success with the Prins and ultimately with the RO80. Unfortunately, that was never going to be the case. The RO80, the car loved for its technical advancements, unique styling, and luxurious ride would ultimately be the car that <laughs> killed the company. The reliability of the engine permanently damaged the reputation of NSU among consumers, and by 1969, only two years after the car was first announced, it was obvious that NSU Motorwerkens was no longer financially viable. <laughs> In 1969, the company was purchased by the Volkswagen Group, merging the NSU with... <laughs> man, Volkswagen has been like buying people forever. Uh, <laughs> merging the NSU with Atio Union, the company in which Audi gets its four rings logo, forming the company Audi NSU Auto Union AG. While NSU would never produce another new car under their name, the RO80 continued its production run for another eight years until coming to a close in April of 1977. Wow. In total, 37,398 RO80s were produced in its 10-year production run in 1985, the company's name was shortened to Audi AG, and the NSU badge was never used again. It's crazy, like, how everything's just connected. Like, Yeah. Everyone's dude. owned everyone at some point. Yeah. Every um, dude, everybody is somebody's somebody, is what I always say. Yep. You do say that a lot. Yeah. yeah. To an annoying degree, some might say. Uh, for all intents and purposes, the rotary engine should have died alongside the RO80 as it wasn't exactly a success, but that didn't stop people from going crazy over the idea of a new kind of engine. The piston-driven internal combustion engine had been around for a little over 103 years at that point, and all of a sudden the public was being introduced to a brand new way to power a car? The amount of public interest <laughs> given... <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> The amount of public interest given to the rotary was unbelievable. After the initial release of the NSU Spider, the rotary-powered sports coupe, almost every car manufacturer rushed to NSU's front door in order to license the rotary engine design for their own car. Even GM tried their hand in making rotary-powered sports cars, which would have honestly been pretty sick. Uh, yeah, they were, there was plans to make a rotary uh, Corvette at some point. Whoa. Uh, basically, if a car had wheels, some company was trying to put a rotary in it. That's not the one that Zora, Zora Arkov Duntov uh, was designing, right? It was. It was going to be a mid engine rotary powered Corvette. That uh, would have made the world a whole lot different than it is now. Yeah, it probably would have yeah. been really <laughs> shitty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I, yeah, I probably, I don't think it would have been. I think it would have been like, wow, remember that time they made a mid-engine Corvette with a rotary? That was kind of weird, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then they, I think the C8, if that had happened, the C8 probably would have been pushed back another like 10 years. Oh, be like, for sure. Wow, At least really if they would have ever done it. Yeah. They'd be like, no, we tried it. It was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. But 
it's here now the c8 and uh james did you get to drive it when we had one uh i drove it for uh i ran some errands in it nice it's such a good car it's so cool i'm not like yeah. a good enough driver for it like yeah. i could feel that i was the one holding it back you know did you get a lot of looks on the crest i've never had so many people look at a car that i've been yeah like I've, everyone I've throws you the, the thumbs up when you're in the seat yeah a bus yeah. driver complimented me that's awesome yeah. And bus drivers see a lot of cars every day. Yeah, you know how hard those guys are to please. <laughs> Do I ever, James? <laughs> Lucky for us, one of the earliest adopters outside of NSU was none other than the Mazda Motor Corporation. In the Here early we 19... Here we go. Yeah. All in right. The early this is where we 60s. go. This is where we go. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, boy, Mazda. You know what car they made. Mazda was <laughs> called... Uh, at the time, in the early 60s, Mazda was still called Toyo Kogyo at the time, and they were facing what looked like an insurmountable challenge. They wanted to become more competitive in the car market. It was the belief of Suneji Matsuda, the company's president at the time, that the best way for the company to survive and outshine the competition was to sell new and innovative technology that would absolutely blow the competition out of the water. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -da -ba. <laughs> Matsuda, sorry, I don't know why I'm adding a soundtrack. Matsuda had been watching the development of the Vankel rotary engine at NSU. And they acquired a license to produce and develop their own variations of the design. Mazda assembled a team of 47 engineers to form the rotary engine research department. It's hard to find a better description of this team than the one on the Mazda website, so here's what they have to say about it. It's, quote, Kenichi Yamamoto, the head of the department, who were venturing into uncharted territory of rotary engine commercialization to that of the Shidrai Shichi Shi, the Shiji <laughs> Shiju Shichi Shi. I'm not laughing at these words. I'm laughing at Nolan's pronunciation. <laughs> sorry. How the, how the, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. <sighs> Compared to that of the Sij Yu Shi Chi Shi. Shuji. Shuji Shi Chi Shi. Shi Joy. Shuji Shi Chi Shi. Sorry, I'm really trying to do this correctly. The Shiju. Wait, but it's spelled differently here. I know. It makes sense. Shi No, it's. Shi It's got to be Sijui. Shi It's Shi Joy Shi Chi Shi. But then the next sentence is spelled right. differently. Well, I think that one's a typo. <laughs> Shiju Shichi Shi is a legendary band of 47 samurai warriors who dedicated their lives with unparalleled loyalty and perseverance to the cause of avenging what they saw as the unjust death of their master. That's a really heavy comparison to make for a group of guys working on a rotary engine. That's all I'll say. Yeah. That's cool. I'm sorry. Are you willing I, I to die for your Apex seals? <laughs> uh, I just want to apologize to any uh, uh, Japanese listeners for me uh, messing up everything just then. Have you ever seen those those TikTok videos where people do a bunch of translations and it's like the in Chinese, like the horse uh, drove the mother to blah, blah, blah. And it's like all these different words, but they're all just like ma different pronunciation of ma so it's like oh, that's funny ma 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 <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good that's a fun language never learned it but it sounds interesting yamamoto told his engineers from now on the rotary engine must be on your minds at all times whether you are sleeping or awake oh my Re god yeah the research team worked tirelessly to find a solution to the issue that doomed nsu to bankruptcy the chatter marks as the central rotor spins around the chamber, each corner of the triangle needs to form an airtight seal to ensure each portion of the engine cycle could occur without interference. Vibrations and impacts of the apex seals on the housing would cause abnormal wear within only a few hours of operation, creating chatter marks. The chatter marks were given the nickname the Devil's Nail Marks, as they would Ooh, eventually lead man. to the destruction of the engine. Yamamoto's team tried any solution they could to mitigate the issue. They tried substituting the metal seals with materials such as gold and silver, and then even tried to use horse and cow bones as apex seal materials. 
After spending a considerable amount of time cramming horse chunks into their engine to see if it would fix the issue, an idea that totally seems reasonable when spoken out loud, they were at an impasse. It seemed as if there would never be a solution to mitigate chatter marks, dooming the engine to last less than 30,000 miles before needing a complete replacement due to damage and wear. So, wow, they're having the same issues mm -hmm. at Mazda than at NSU. Mm -hmm. Crazy. The rotary engine quickly became viewed as a waste of money within the company. While some people would be demoralized by the lack of support, the criticisms of the program only made the Samurai 47 work harder at finding a goal. Huh. The uncertainty of the project is what kept them moving. It wasn't until 1963 that the first major breakthrough was made. Since vibrations were causing the damage, an engineer proposed modifying the shape of the apex seal, which in turn would modify the frequency characteristics. Well, there now you go, genius. The Sounds like you figured it out. Frequency characteristics the whole time, man. <laughs> the new shape of the apex seal would be known as a, quote, cross hollow design. They drilled horizontal and vertical holes throughout the seal in a grid pattern to change the frequency dynamics of the piece. To the team's surprise, the chatter marks completely disappeared after testing the new seal design. Now all they needed was a car to put it in. Mazda revealed a prototype of the Mazda Cosmo at the 1964 Tokyo Motor Show, the same year that NSU released its rotary-powered two-door, the Spider. The Cosmo wouldn't enter production for another three years, finally gracing the showroom floor in 1967. The name Cosmo was chosen to reflect the global fascination in the space race and to compare their forward-thinking innovation with and rotary engine to that of man's journey into space. Much like the space race, advancing their rotary technology was going to be a long and expensive road, but it would cement Mazda's name in the history books as one of the most prominent companies in the world. And that's where we'll pick up the story on next week's episode of Past Gas. That's right. We're going to talk about Mazda. We're going to talk about Rolls Royce. Uh, we're going to talk Whoa. about Mercedes, all these different companies. Now that the rotary cat is out of the, out of the apex seal bag, uh, People are going to try some weird stuff. All right. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Pass Gas. I want to thank our producer, Kanan, this week. I yeah, always forget, to, I always forget to thank Kanan. Oh, Kanan. We love Kanan. Uh, you, you don't Kanan. see him on camera. All right. All right. Anyway, uh, thank you for listening to Pass Gas, as always. Uh, if you've never listened to our, or if you've never seen our videos on YouTube, we're at Donut Media on YouTube. You can find us there. Uh, follow James on all social media at James Pumphrey. Follow Joe at Joe G Weber and follow me at Nolan J Sykes. Um, tell someone about our podcast. If you like this podcast and you have a buddy who, who you think would like the show, uh, please let them know. Uh, Only Zillennials, please. <laughs> all right. Later. All right.